I was the only Korean in a white family in the Midwest. We did have, my parents also did make a, a point to uh, belong to a group of, of families that had also adopted from Korea. There was an adoption group. And I don't remember it very much, but I see pictures of myself and I was wearing Korean dresses and um, we had Korean food and I always grew up having a kind of an American version of Korean food and I liked that. It wasn't spicy and so when I went back to Korea, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> and then uh, when I was six, we moved to Alabama. Not a lot of Koreans there. <laughs> but I, and then we, we moved when I was 11 to the Washington, D.C. area. And I went to junior high and high school in Montgomery County. Um, I just want to mention that if you have ever met parents or people who have adopted children, you know that they are super parents. They, you know, it's a really deliberate choice. It's more expensive than having kids by birth. And it's not as you know, painful physically to give birth, but I think it's really painful emotionally. And there's a lot that they go through. And so that's why I'm here, because it was hard for me to grow up in this adoptee for a lot of different reasons, but I think, um, I want to share my story so that other parents who've adopted and other kids can um, hear my perspective, I guess. Um, as a young kid growing up in a white American family, it's kind of tough because you get made fun of at school, at least I did, and the kids would ask me where I was from, and people had heard of China and Japan, but they hadn't really heard of Korea, at least you know, kids on the playground. And so I felt like, you know, what am I? And I'm kind of weird. And they do the Chinese eyes to you. And it's kind of tough because you, you bear that alone. You don't have any brothers or sisters that can share that with you. And as a teen, it's also really tough. Um, it was tough for me. And I'm in a, a different generation than in you are. And um, this is just a wonderful area to grow up in, too, because it's so diverse. But um, like when you're dating and you try to figure out who you are and you know you feel white on the inside but you look Korean on the outside and you're trying to make yourself attractive and it's, it's kind of tough. Um, the biggest thing that changed my life when I was a teenager was this guy I was dating like all through high school. We were like this. He told me, you know, his parents never thought he would marry someone that wasn't white. And that just like hit me. And um... Yeah, you know, so I moved on, but it's it's not that easy um, when you're growing up as a minority in a white family. Um, there are two things that helped me to get a little perspective and to grow up and move on, and it was going to Korea as a college student and having kids of my own. Um, when I was in college, I volunteered for Holt International. That's the largest international adoption agency in the world, I believe. It's adopted over uh, 40,000 children from all different continents in the last 50 years or so. I, I applied to be an, uh, a volunteer for one summer, summer after my freshman year. And I went and I lived there. And uh, I also participated on the Motherland Tour. That's a tour that they have for adult adoptees to go back and learn about their culture. It was the neatest experience because I met other adopted Koreans about my age, early 20s, from all over the place, different places in America, like California, Minnesota, um, Massachusetts, I think, and different places in Europe. Finland, Norway, and Denmark. And what I noticed was we were all really different. I was really different from the adoptees in California and other parts of the United States, and the Europeans were completely different too. They all, had, they all really had the culture from where they came from. But at the same time, we also had a lot of the same similarities. We had grown up being re really different in a family, in a certain culture, and we all went through that um, together. So we related on that, that level, and it was, that was interesting. And the other um, powerful thing for me was 
when I um, was there, you know, finally going back to Korea to be with my people, well, I was not like them. I was not, I didn't walk like them, I didn't dress like them. I, w um, I was kind of chubby back then, so I didn't even look like them. Um, so I really didn't fit in there. But then it helped me to realize that, you know, I'm an American. I'm a kind of a special kind of American, but that's my culture. So that was very helpful to me. And um, my children, I, I married an Ecuadorian, and I have um, two children that look sort of half Hispanic, half Korean, but they fit just perfectly in the Washington, D.C. area. <laughs> you know, we, we uh, live in Fairfax, and there's kids from all over in the classes. And so I think it, it, it's great that we live here. And it's, for me personally as an adoptee, it's really neat to look into someone's eyes and see like a small reflection of yourself. Um, and so finally, I just want to say that I really value my unique position because I'm a small business owner and I have to network. And having all these different ways to connect to people is valuable. If I want to talk to a Korean, you know, they look at me and I can talk to them and we can relate. But then I also kind of mix into the white American um, space as well. And I also get to apply for special status as a government contractor, being a minority. And, you know, I use that and it's, it's very helpful. So I really value, um, like, who I am now. It's taken a while, but I do. Thanks. I'm Sue Walther. I'm Rebecca's very, very proud mom and grandparent uh, with my husband to two gorgeous, gorgeous grandkids. Uh, so, and, and wonderful son-in-law, you know, get, get to include him in there too. Rich and I decided when we lived in Korea um, back in 1970 that, that we, you know, you're, you're sitting on a bus, you look outside, you see this gorgeous little child, you've, had, you've loved being in Korea, he was in the army. We had fallen in love with the people, the culture, the times. And, and we just looked at this lovely child, a mere Asian child by the side of the road, and we said, put that on a life list, we're gonna have one of those, you know, in our family kind of thing. And four or five years later, when it was time to start a family, we went through the adoption process, we went through Holt, Rebecca came home on Friday the 13th, it was the best Friday the 13th, you know, in, in, in May that year. And she's right, we lived in a very small town in Woodstock, Illinois, um, People didn't know what to do with her. You know, is she black? That's, that's what I heard. You know, I would, I would be a defender of Korean culture. We had brought home Korean chests and Korean dresses and Korean foods and, and you know, uh, recipes and connections. I mean, we had truly fallen in love with the history and the times and, and the culture of that place. And somebody had said, well, is that why you have a daughter? And I went, no, we wanted to have a daughter. We didn't want to have another piece of Korea Anna with us. So um, as a matter of fact, we had planned to adopt our second child from Korea through Holt and, and Matthew was born to us. And the letter came from Holt saying, we've got your second child, he's ready to come. We said, thank you very much. We have a boy and a girl, that's all we really want. So make somebody else happy. So we were very, very pleased to have that um, connection with Korea uh, made permanent through Rebecca because it made us be very much aware that we would have to, to work hard to be able to make these kind of connections. We did have friends in, in Holt, uh, in, in the small town in Illinois. We um, uh, would go to Chicago. We would, it, it was difficult, I will admit. It was difficult to be able to, to raise the, the Korean flag and, and to make those kind of connections. It was difficult in Alabama, you know, when you move there in the mid 80s, it's, it's, it's not very many Koreans there. However, Rebecca did go to a wonderful elementary school and I remember, you know, there were times when you would dress, the people, the, the kids from all around the city, it was a very multi kind of um, uh, school, they were encouraged to come in in their, in their uh, host, their home country's outfits. And so Rebecca got to wear the Hanbach and what have you that we've gotten for, her. not just at Halloween, you know, you got to wear it at school and stuff. So, but she's right. Coming here to DC, she said to us about a week after she arrived, she said, Oh, mom, I don't look so different anymore. So we really began to understand how difficult it was for you as an individual because it wasn't, it, by the time we had gotten to, you know, late elementary school, we had just 
mellowed out. I think Rebecca had taken the lead when she was younger in terms of seeking interest, and we would go to adoption groups and, and events and stuff. But then as she got older, it was just like, no, she didn't want to do that kind of thing. So, so we, we pulled back. Um, by the time we got here, then again, it was a matter of saying, you know, she would, be, you know, as, as a person entering junior high school, getting ready for high school, what, is, what does she want to do? What is, she would take the lead on that. I do remember Beck coming home one day, you know, and walking up the, the front walk with one of her friends, and she turned to me and went, oh, yes, that's right. Um, uh, my parents are Caucasian. I'm adopted. Uh, come on in. Because <laughs> you were just, you were very comfortable with the whole thing. And, but it was still, we knew that there was going to be a difference. Our, our caseworker said to us when we were looking into this, you know, what are you going to do when she turns 18? What are you going to do when somebody doesn't want to marry her? You know, I mean, it was, and we just said, that's not going to happen. But these kind of, of long-held concerns stay with us for a long time. So um, it's, it's really nice that, you know, it, it turned out the way it did. The person you married, you know, was just fine with that. So I remember Rich and I were very, very pleased that Rebecca chose to go to Korea um, with this motherland tour. We'd always thought we would go back with her. We always thought that we would, you know, be there when she went back. She went on her own, and that was fine. When, when she called to say that there was an opportunity to perhaps connect with a birth family, you know, here we were, six, 7,000 miles away, weeping on one end of the, you know, the, the long distance phone call as she was over there. But it was like, if you're brave enough to ask the questions, you're brave enough to receive the answers. And that's what she did when she was over there. So it was, and, and we, by the time your daughter turns 18 or 19 or 20, She's the adult you want her to be. And so she sets the lead. She's the one who decides how much embracing goes on from there. I would like it if my grandkids, you know, spoke more Korean, but that's okay, you know. But it's, but it's, it's the kind of thing where we're not in charge anymore. So I, I would think that what we do is, is open it up and then provide as many opportunities as possible and rejoice in what we've got. One of the things working in American history is that it talks about you know, a first-generation immigrant doesn't learn the language, doesn't really, you know, introduce him or herself to the culture. The second generation is bilingual, does pick up something from both. You know, the third generation is just totally Americanized. And I think you probably skipped a generation or two in there and went right to being pretty... You, you did the generational changes in your lifetime instead of waiting a whole other year or a whole other generation. So I think the question is, what happens you know, with adoptees, you know, how do they make this kind of difficult, um, or, or how do they do this kind of transition? The hope would be, I think, is to be able to, to select the parts of each culture that you're a part of and make it part of your own. So, thank you.